Now I'll ask you to turn in your Bibles again to the book of Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 2. And if you have a numbered Bible, it's page 976. Ephesians chapter 2. And we're going to read again beginning at verse number 8. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse number 8. You have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. Not a result of works so that no one may boast. Let's read this together again. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. We've been reading this verse a number of nights in a row and taking up some of the precious truths that are found in this verse. The great truth of being saved and rescued from perishing in your sins. The great truth about God's grace that God is unwilling to let us merely drop into hell, but that in his infinite and eternal loving kindness, God has made a way so that undeserving sinners can be rescued and be saved. And furthermore, we learn that God offers this graciously as a gift. All of the expense has been borne by himself. Everything that was required to satisfy God has been provided by God. It, isn't that interesting? I was thinking today, that's like going into a, a, a department store and having the man at the front hand you the money so that you could purchase the goods that you, that you, that you desire. That is actually what God has done. God has graciously, at his own expense, paid for and provided exactly what I need. I want to tell you something. God's salvation fits me perfectly. It's exactly what I need. And the God who requires it has supplied it. That's why I'm so happy and confident in God's salvation. He knew what I needed, and that's what he gave me. And last of all, we talked last night about the great truth about faith. Faith is simply depending on what God says. I, th I think Mr. Fraser and I would be absolutely appalled if we thought that somehow going to heaven would require you to believe us. Now, I, I think I can speak for him. I at least will speak for myself. I hope we are honorable men. I hope we haven't come here in any way to deceive you or to mislead you or, 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 or something like that. No, we, we've come honestly, but we're human beings. We've been mistaken before. And I want to tell you the forgiveness of sins and escaping the judgment of God and being in heaven and being the possessor of eternal life is not something to be mistaken about. That's why we want you to depend on God, upon Christ and his work, and upon his word, that tells us that that work is finished. You see, we're not here to build up this church. That's not our objective. We're not here to gain members. We're not here to financially uh, be benefited by you being here. We're not here because we're arrogant or egotistical and we're trying to build the biggest congregation in Sarnia. Nothing could be further from the truth. We're here for one thing. We're here to tell you what God says about you and about your sin, and about how it can be forgiven, and how the Lord Jesus, his son, died on the cross 
so that that very thing could take place. God wants you to depend on that. That's why this gift must be received by faith. I want to take up the last, I, I'll speak on something else, Lord willing, tomorrow night. But I want to speak about the last phrase of this wonderful statement that Paul makes. Paul says, by grace you have been saved by faith. And that salvation does not originate with you. It is a gift from God. And then he says this, it is not a result of works, so that no one may boast. I'm going to tell you something, and uh, I'm not sure that everybody here will know this, but the number one religion in Sarnia tonight does not have a denominational name. It isn't, you know, Catholics or Baptists or Presbyterians or Brethren or whatever the case may be. That's not the name of the biggest religion in Sarnia. The biggest religion in Sarnia is this. I'm working my way to heaven. That's kind of long to put on the signboard. But I will tell you that if you talk to more than five people in this town, you're going to discover that that's what they're depending on. And so I want to think about this tonight. And just look at it from God's word and make sure. I know maybe there's somebody here and you say, well, you know, I'm looking around. And most of the people here have grown up in a Christian home, and the people that haven't have been to the gospel meeting before, and certainly you're tilting at some windmill. Nobody could possibly believe that they need to work their way to heaven. I want to tell you something. You're wrong. There's plenty of people who grew up in this gospel hall and have heard the gospel preached, and in the back of their mind, the devil is telling them, you need to do something to please God. You know, we live in a very um, heavily regulated world. It, 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 there's almost nothing that you need to do or you want to do that is not covered by a, a million regulations and a million requirements. If you're in the building business, you know all about this. I was reading an article the other day about the city of San, Fran uh, of, uh, San Francisco in California they wanted to build one toilet in a park for the people to use. And um, the, the article just kind of set me back at my heels. It was going to cost $1.7 million for a single stall toilet. Now, uh, I, I need to be in the toilet business because that's, uh, that's pretty good. That isn't the part of the story that staggered me. The part of the story that staggered me is what they had to go through to build it. They, they, I just wrote this down. There were 56 different uh, 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 regulatory organizations and 74 oversight bodies that had to be satisfied before you could put up one toilet. That, I, I'm begging the obvious here, but that's a lot of regulation. So really, my mind just went in this direction, we'll ask a question of you, what are God's requirements for heaven? You see, I'm happy to tell you tonight, I, 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 I don't believe in making the gospel mysterious. I'm going to tell you right up front that God's salvation can't be purchased by $1.7 million. And God's salvation is not subject to 56 commissions and 74 oversight bodies. The God of heaven has one requirement, and that is that you receive his son, and you will be saved. I'm not a complicated man, and I'm glad that God's salvation is not a complicated thing. God says, look at my son and what he has done. Look at the cross and the blood of Christ that cleanses from all sin. Look at the empty tomb that shows that God is satisfied. Just look, and you will live. I want to think about three or four things about a works salvation. And I just want to show you very clearly from the Bible that there's no way that that's a, a requirement of God. The first thing I want to point out is that 
working your way to heaven, working to satisfy God, contradicts the clear statements of the Bible. You say, that's too simple. Well, <laughs> that's where we're going to start. Because the Apostle Paul, writing by, uh, by, by the Holy Spirit of God, says this, God's salvation is not a result of works. Now, if English is not your first language, forgive me for this, but in English, this is what we call an unequivocal statement. It just means this, there's no room for debating. There's no uh, way, no shades of meaning that need to be parsed in order to understand this verse. God speaks in language that my friends right here in the front row can understand. God says, you don't get to heaven. Yeah, I'm talking to you. God doesn't, you, a person cannot get to heaven by working. That's what he says. There are other verses that tell us that. Uh, we, we find in Titus chapter 3 that salvation is not by works of righteousness, good deeds that we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. Now, I want to say something just really quickly here because I've been accused of this before, and I want to make sure that you don't misunderstand. When we preach the gospel, we are not disparaging hard work. And we are not disparaging doing good things. I will tell you right now, it's good to obey your parents because God told us to. It's good to be generous. It's good to be kind. It's good to be sympathetic. There's a lot of things that people do and I'll tell you what, you will not advance the gospel by pretending that those good things are bad things. They're not. And those things God has established, you know, God, God has built it into the universe as a way to succeed in life, working hard. Here's the issue I want you to remember. This may be God's way to be successful on earth, but it's not God's way to go to heaven. Maybe I'll say it in another way. It's good to be good. And it is good, but it's not good enough to take us to heaven. In fact, if you went home tonight, and that's what you remembered out of my message, I'd be quite pleased. Lest someone somehow could be deceived into thinking that God wants more prayers, that, that God wants more uh, religion, that, that God wants more uh, philanthropy, that God maybe even wants more faith. I'm not sure if that even makes sense, but I want you to understand that doing anything, much less doing more, will not earn a place in God's heaven. I am so impressed with coming to the border when I come over into Canada. And I come over here quite a few times a year, uh, coming here and other places. When I get to the border, you know, there's some very stringent requirements. There are big signs up, and they don't contain suggestions. They say, stop, and go, and yes, and no. Things are, are, are not fuzzy. Things are not cloudy. The Canadian government has a very clear idea of what they require for me to come visit you. And so it is with God. And one of the things that God wants you to clearly understand tonight, I hope I can just make this as clear as possible. You cannot earn your way into heaven. It cannot be done. God will not accept it. And if you are resting on that tonight, my dear friend, I want to disabuse you of any hope that that might give you for your future and for your eternity. The Bible says, God says, not of works, lest anyone should boast. The second thing I want to mention about working for salvation is that it overestimates your ability 
to please God. You know, we, uh, naturally speaking, we, we try to put our best foot forward. I'll just give you a, a little example of this. I always smile at this. Uh, I, on my way to the little gospel hall where, I, uh, where my wife and I are, um, we go by a little section of town where there are a number of used car lots. And there's something very interesting about used car lots. And some of these are a little bit on the shady side, I think. But, but here's the thing I, I've always noticed. They, they always put the nice side facing the street. So you've got to be kidding me. What's that got to do with the gospel? Well, it's just this. If you actually went around on the other side, you would see the dents and the piece of chrome that's missing and the mirror that's hanging down. But, but this man is trying to make an impression on you, the shiny side out. And one day I was thinking about that, and I thought that's exactly what we do with God. We try to show God our shiny side. We try to impress God in our thinking with what we think are things that are acceptable to him, all the while never recognizing that God sees the whole person. I want to speak just soberly for a minute. It's, uh, it's not that hard to try and make a good impression on other people. I stand up here tonight and I look out on an audience of people who are nicely dressed and well-groomed and politely listening to the gospel and I see nothing that bothers me or discourages me in the meeting tonight. People are listening, people are showing some attention, people follow along as we read. But here's what I can't see. I can't see the sin that is in your heart. I cannot see the disobedience, the waywardness, the rebellion, even in some people, the violence and the lust and the, and the, and the lies and the, and the dark things that you don't want anybody else to know. And right now, God is looking at you. The Bible says that man looks on the outside, good enough. But God looks at the heart. And I don't know what's in your heart, but I know what's in my heart. And I'm pretty sure it's in the heart of everybody else. The Bible says that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked who can know it. The fact of the matter is that you cannot even calculate the depths of what is in your own heart. We don't even know ourselves. So corrupted by sin, so far fallen from what God designed us to be. And even little children have hearts that are darkened by sin. And I would tonight before God that you would realize that it is your sin that is occasioning the judgment of God, that it is your sin that is pressing you toward a lost eternity, an eternity of suffering beneath the judgment of God. Sin is no insignificant thing. What folly it is to try and convince God that you are good enough to be in heaven. You know, I was just a little boy when God saved me. I was only eight years old. And I know sometimes that I underestimate what eight-year-old children, my own grandchildren, are thinking about. But I want to tell you that uh, eight or nine or ten or whatever year old children are capable of some fairly complex thoughts. And one of the things that dawned on me before God saved me was just this awful burden of sin that I could not relieve myself of. I would have done anything to get rid of my sin. I re- I, 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 I'm not saying that lightly or thoughtlessly, but I really, I really felt the weight of it and the desire to be rid of it and the awful powerlessness to do anything to truly make myself right before God. I hope there's nobody here tonight that thinks that you can fool God. 
I hope there's nobody here tonight that thinks that you can somehow adjust your life so that God only sees what you consider to be the shiny side of your life. Let's just get real here tonight. We've all sinned. All of us have corrupt and wicked hearts. You may not like this kind of preaching, but I want to tell you something. Unless you bow to it, you'll never be in heaven. We are ruined and rebellious in our sin. And God will not accept us as we are in our sin. You know, there's a corollary that goes with that. And that is that trying to work our way to heaven not only overestimates our ability to please God, but it underestimates how holy God is. I, I like to think about God. Uh, you say, well, you're a preacher, that's, that's your job, but uh, I, th I think we all ought to spend some time thinking about God. What is God like? I mean, after all, if we express some desire to be in heaven with him eternally, I guess maybe we ought to know the kind of God that we're seeking after, shouldn't we? You know, there's a common idea, and, 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 and this is throughout Western culture, that God is just some benevolent Santa Claus. And, uh, you know, he, he's not in the business, I, I don't mean to be irreverent by this, but God's never going to deliver any lumps of coal. We're all his children... And he loves all of us, and we're all pretty lovable. And in the end, God's just, you know, God's just going to be God. And in his benevolence and in his kindness and in his love, he's just going to bless everybody. I have more bad news. Because God is exactly the opposite of everything I just said in the last paragraph. Oh, I, I don't mean that God is not a God of love. I'm not saying that God is not a God of benevolence, that God is not a God of infinite kindness and grace. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is this, that apart from the forgiveness of your sins, you will never know a single particle of all those things that I've just said. You see, God is holy. Do you know what it means to be holy? To be holy is to be utterly different than anything else. To be transcendently higher and greater and purer than anything that this universe knows. We have a holy God. Joe Stoll, I think, I don't know if I mentioned this the other day, but I'll mention it again. Joe Stoll was the president of Moody Bible Institute for a number of years. And uh, he, he said something one time that um, made a great impression on me. He said, you know, people's view of God is so, is so corrupted that they assume that if the Almighty God were to somehow step through the back doors of this gospel hall, that we would all be lined up to shake his hand and to have him sign our hymn book and, and to, you know, have a wee chat. He said, the people that think like that know nothing about the Bible. Because the people in the Bible who came into the flaming presence of a holy and an eternal God actually fell on their faces. They didn't even know if they were alive or dead. So great was the awesomeness of this holy God. If you're not saved tonight, it would be good to tremble at the thought of meeting him. Now I'm going to tell you that Believers fear God, but it's in an altogether different way. I am in awe of his greatness. I hope I grow in that awe every day. And I fear displeasing him. That is true. But I remember when God brought me to tremble at the thought of a guilty sinner standing in the presence of a holy God. You know what? All of us here tonight, speaker included, are too casual about God. God is infinitely holy, and to come before him in your sins will be to be cast into a lake that burns with fire and brimstone eternally. Maybe we need some adjustment in our thinking tonight. 
This is no triviality. This is no thing by the side. This is no, you know, just some uh, little part of what this little group of Christians thinks. This is actually at the very heart of what we believe. That in heaven tonight, there is a God of infinite, indescribable, implacable holiness that requires judgment for every sin. And if your sins have never been forgiven, you need to tremble at the thought of meeting him. Now, I'm not here to scare you tonight because that's not my job. My job is just to tell you what the Bible says. And I'll tell you something else. You can't scare people into God's salvation. It's never happened, and it's not going to start tonight. But it would be a good thing in the presence of God just to look into our own hearts and see what we really are are. And if you're not saved tonight, to take a good look at God and see who he really is. I have one more thing, and it's just this. A work's salvation completely removes the necessity for the cross. I, I, I was really enjoying listening to Mr. Frazier speak tonight, and, and he, was, he was telling you about the cross. He was telling you about the Lord Jesus who came to Calvary willingly and voluntarily because he loved us and the suffering that he endured. He was describing, do you kids remember what he was talking about? That there were people that hit him and people that spit on him and people that tore the beard out of his, uh, off of his face. And he was describing not only that, but the sufferings that came from God and the awful death that he endured. What's that about? Because if you can work your way to heaven, then the cross is the biggest tragedy that the world has ever known. And I'm not going to use the language that some people do about God being a, a you know, a abusive to his son. I, I don't think that's helpful. I'm just going to say this. We need the cross because we can't do anything else. I'm so glad for Calvary. I'm so glad. You know, I, I've never been to the Middle East myself. And uh, I, I've never been to the physical place where they say Jesus died or where they say he was buried. I have no doubt that there's probably some truth to the places they found, I, I really don't know. But that isn't necessary. Because I, I've been there through the Bible, through the scriptures. And I've been there by faith, and I have depended on what God has said about the great accomplishments of the Savior who died. And I'm so glad that God is not looking for me to work my way to heaven. I'm glad that God is satisfied with the work that Jesus Christ did. Would you listen to his own words? You know, the words of Christ, I, I have a Bible, somebody gave me a Bible at home, and they have all the words of Christ in red. I didn't ask for it, and I probably wouldn't have elected to have it, I don't use it all the time, because really, Every word in the scriptures is of equal importance, okay? I think we all believe that. The, the scriptures are God-breathed, and I don't see how making some words highlighted is any improvement. But I have to tell you, when I look at it, it's kind of nice to see the words of Christ just jump out at you. Here's something I love. He said to the Father, I have glorified you on earth, having finished the work that you gave me to do. The world is full of people who are trying their works. God is satisfied with one work. It's the work of his son. Mr. Moody uh, actually uh, met a lady one day, and she said, you know, she said, I'm, I'm very confused. 
She said, I go around to the churches here in Chicago and there are so many religions and, and so many preachers. She said, how can I know which one is right? Mr. Booty smiled and he said, ma'am, he said, there are only two religions in the world. One is called doing and one is called done. Doing, the hymn writer said, is a deadly thing. Doing will take you down to hell just as if you never tried. There is only one refuge for the sinner tonight. It is a finished work. It is a work that is done. It is a work that has satisfied God. And it's a work that could satisfy you if you would just depend on it. You know, in closing, I, I was thinking about how God wants you to treat the cross. You know, when you came in here tonight, <clears throat> You, uh, you didn't intend to stand up for the whole meeting. And so you looked around for an available chair. And I watched some of you come in. And uh, you know, it's interesting to me that I, I didn't see anybody pick up the chair and look at the underside of it to see who the manufacturer was. And I didn't see anybody go to the back and ask one of the brothers, you know, how, how, how much did they cost? And uh, what are the details of the construction? And, 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 and what are all of the uh, technical specifications for the chair? Hmm? People just came in here and they put their weight on it. They depended on somebody to make it the right way. And in fact, nobody here uh, directly paid for these chairs even. The price was paid for by the believers in this assembly. When you came in, you just rested. Confidently. I didn't see a single person sitting on the chair with half their body and the other half leaning out on one foot like they had to jump out in the aisle. I didn't see a single person. Everybody just sat down. And they depended on it. You say, God's salvation can't be that simple. Well, you're wrong because it is that simple. The God who gave his own son is a God who can be fully depended on. The price that was paid satisfied every demand of God. It's, I like what the Bible says. He sees the, the suffering of his soul and he is satisfied. And I look back over the years to the night in a little back bedroom of a farmhouse just over in Michigan, and just with the simplicity of a child, I just rested on what Christ had done. And so tonight, as I bring this meeting to a close, you have a choice tonight. You, you can try to please God with what you do. You can try. But there's only one thing that God accepts, and that's the work of his son. Trust Christ tonight. Depend on him. That finished work will carry you through life. It will carry you into the Father's house. It will carry you into a Savior's arms who will never let you go. Oh, what a wonderful message the gospel is. May God just rivet these thoughts on your heart. It is by grace that we are saved through faith. That not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should 